I do want to talk a little bit about how we go about fixing <laughs> this food system, and I'm sure you would like to talk about that too, I hope. <laughs> um, obviously, we have to address the corporate power that's dominating this food system. We have to address uh, the, the, again, bipartisan approval, increasingly bipartisan approval of merger after merger after merger of agribusness, not, you know, of course, happens across the board, pharmaceuticals, publishing, other areas as well. Um, but in the food industry, all of these giant corporate mergers need to be stopped. Excuse me. We need to reform antitrust law. You know, this sounds kind of, again, maybe either boring or remote, or how on earth would we even do that? <laughs> Well, we can do that on, we can start to do that by informing ourselves and educating others about the corporate control and by spreading the word about, you know, more than 40% of the, basically just about every major food, you know, commodity in America being controlled by four corporations. Mainstream economists say this is not healthy. This is not a good way to run things. Um, more and more discussion of the, the symmetry, the continuity between the economic control and the political control, that understanding and analysis has to get out there. Um, we obviously need to be uh, electing politicians who make this a key point in their agenda. You know, in the presidential elections, they say almost nothing about food. I wrote a story back in 2016 called The Great Food Blackout of 2016. And it was just a story about like all the things that were not being talked about, or the few things that the politicians did say, um, you know, about farm subsidies or a couple other areas, um, but really hardly anything at all. So we have to force our politicians on every level. So you know, if, if you can't get to your congressional representative, you can get to your local representative. You know, bringing that lens back to our community as well, like. What's around us? You know, what's the inventory around us in terms of are there enough farms in the periphery of our community? Can, you know, is all of the land being gobbled up by developers? How do we develop incentives to reverse that trend? It's not going to just happen on its own, right? All the economic incentives are in the wrong direction. So, you know, and, and again, that's happening for a reason. I mean, if you're having us, you know, one farmer go under every half an hour in America, that's not a real economic incentive to get into farming. If you know that you're not gonna have any kind of a subsidy support or some other kind of support to get into farming. If you're not gonna get into farming, you're gonna have more and more communities that are far away from good, healthy produce. So you're gonna have more and more long distance transport of food, you're gonna have more and more pollution from that. So we have to get politicians on every level to make food a central piece of what they talk about. It's not even, most of the time, it's not even on the list, <laughs> frankly. I mean, I, you know, I can't remember the last time somebody running for San Francisco, where I live, you know, it's, we have a supervisor, it's like city council. Um, and, you know, food never gets talked about. And yet, we all eat every day, and it's like absolutely foundational to human existence, right? And if we don't address all these conditions that I've been talking about in a systemic, in a systemic fashion, then we're, we're screwed, <laughs> to put it bluntly. We're, we're, you know, we're not gonna get where we need to get to. Um, I did wanna point out some hopeful things that are happening around the country, and I'm sure some of you have examples of your own as well. Um, we are seeing more and more examples of what works actually happening in the ground. Probably some of the companies here sponsoring this today are part of that, I'm sure. Uh, we're seeing more and more agroecology. How many folks have heard that term? Okay. Um, so agroecology is a movement that came out of Latin America, but it's more of, more of a global movement. Um, it's a long-standing practice and set of practices within farming that includes organic but also diversified production, and it's a whole set of agricultural principles, really, that also incorporates uh, food sovereignty, so having a community have as much of its own food supply as possible. I'm not one of those sort of 
isolationist believers that we have to have every community have all of its own food. It would be nice, but it's not going to happen. And there are reasons why, you know, not every place has the right geography or climate. But I think that producing as much of our own food as we can is, is an optimal goal that every community should have policies around. How do we zone land? You know, and some of this is happening on small scales. Um, there are incentives for urban farming. We're seeing a whole urban agriculture, urban farming movement really blossom across a lot of America. And it's not even that, it's, it's pretty significant really. I mean, like Detroit is, a, is a, a great example where you've got this like absolutely devastated urban landscape. And out of that is, is starting to sprout up, among other things, urban farms. And you've got folks, um, some of them are real Detroiters, they're not just coming in from outside, who are reclaiming some of that land. We have a situation across cities, across America, and, you know, as well as towns, where there's vacant, unused land. And you know, so how can we develop local policies that say, um, that could trigger incentives to say, like, unused land can be used for farmland? All right, then you do the soil samples. You find out, you know, how, what, what do we need to do to get it into farming shape? It might take a couple of years of cover crops and everything else and, you know, getting more nitrogen in the soil, everything, you know. But, like, where is the policy to make that happen? You know, we need to see policies that demand, for instance, that vacant land in cities and towns, that that become a, one of the key priorities. You know, maybe uh, housing poor people and homeless people and growing food, you know, maybe those would be, should be the two priorities for, for unused land instead of uh, real estate tax write-offs, for instance. How about it? <laughs> Sounds like a, a, a better way to go to me. Um, we do see examples, you know, across other parts of the world where the agroecology movement, which again brings in not just organic farming, but these principles of economic survival for farmers and food security for communities and diversified food production. So it's not just like we're all having it flown in to have enough food. Um, millions of farmers around the world are doing this. Millions of farmers in India are starting to move away from uh, GMO production, which has been forced on them, literally basically almost forced on them by uh, lending practices and marketing practices by the industry. Uh, they're starting to push back and they're starting to demand uh, you know, that they grow their own food in, in their own way. And the importance of this is not just that they're going away from GMOs, and this could apply to places like Mexico and Central America as well that have been devastated by uh, not only trade regimes like NAFTA, but also by trade dynamics that have forced them to sell, you know, their version of palm oil, for instance. So the importance of taking back land whether it's in India or Mexico or Central America, is that farmers who have this long-standing tradition who know how to do it can not only make a living and not be beholden to these corporations, they can also supply food for their communities. So they can sell to local and regional markets. They can grow diversified. And, they, and therefore, you, know, you don't have communities that we now have in Mexico and, and actually in the United States as well, you've got farming communities that can't feed themselves, not only because they might be too poor, but because they're not growing anything they can eat. As we mentioned earlier in terms of the corporate dominated food system demanding raw ingredient commodities instead of diversified food. So we're only gonna get there by resisting and pushing back on every level, uh, locally and globally, in that direction. Um, you know, the, the, the battle, of course, is there's this huge gulf between these amazing solutions that are already happening on the ground and where things are actually going in terms of the, these political and economic dynamics. And, you know, it can drive me nuts because I feel like this is not something where we have to study more. This is the solutions are there. <laughs> and they've been well proven and they are happening. And the answer, I would submit, is to get the money, the incentives, um, and the access to all this into, to, to basically reverse the whole situation in our economy and our politics. Now, wonderful, how do we do that? Um, so just, you know, to, to close out my portion of this, and then I want to invite conversation and questions. Um, 
we need to think in terms of getting our political systems, again, on every level, to incentivize and subsidize, whether you call it a subsidy or a form of insurance um, or just a public investment. I mean, I would like to say, call it a public investment that our tax dollars would go into a food system that nurtures us, that nourishes us, that nourishes the land, that values farmers, that values workers that are making our food, that all these things go into the price of food that we're all paying now. And we're paying it all dearly and all in the wrong direction, right? Even if we're eating the right foods for us, the, wrong, the, the, food, you know, the larger grocery bill that we pay in our tax dollars is paying for all that suffering. We're cleaning up the mess that's created by these corporations. We're subsidizing not just the 15 to 20 billion dollars that we're already paying, we're subsidizing their practices and their profits through all the ways that we pay tax dollars to pick up the mess, whether it's environmental cleanup or um, you know, injured workers who are injured for the rest of their lives and who don't have insurance or money so the public health system, such as it is, <laughs> it's not much, but such as it is, picks up the pieces. And they can't work, so they get unemployment. They get food stamps. And you know, I'm all for all that. But again, it becomes, the dynamic is that all that becomes another subsidy. So instead, what we need to do is take all that investment and push, again, on every level, local. Take, you know, go to your city council, go to your town council. What are we doing about food in our community? You know, look around us. Like, do we have a farmer's market? Great. How can we, like, how can we expand the farmer's market? Are, are all the farmers in the area using it? How can we create incentives for more farmers to use the farmer's market? How can we create incentives for vacant land to produce food? Right? All these different things. How can we restructure the current 15 to 20 billion dollar official subsidy system to be instead a public government investment in a new food system that subsidizes organic production, or so let's just say supports, that invests in organic, diversified production that incentivizes smaller scale food producers around this country, and that supports a living wage for farm workers and food, work, food industry workers. Um, that's what we need to do. It's a long project. We can all start to do it in our own different ways, educating, spreading the word, talking in our communities, and again, talking with anybody in politics that we can get to, <laughs> uh, or organizations. Talk with organizations you know that can get to them. And start putting this on the agenda. And together, we'll just keep moving toward in that direction, rebuild our food system. Thank you very much.